Hello, this is Rich, and this is part two of a part five training series. Today's tutorial is going to discuss updating SDK databases. We're going to show you objects in SDK, how to insert those objects, how to change the properties on those objects, i.e. modify them, and we're going to understand why you will use different objects in SDK. So this is our second lesson, Objects and Properties. This is just a real quick introduction to this particular tutorial. So I'm going to go ahead and pick some interesting parts out of this tutorial to show you how it works. Again, if you want to go through some detail, make sure you go through the lesson in detail. And inside the tutorial itself, if you're just a satellite operator, you can just look at satellites. If you're a ground operator and you want to learn how to bring in ground vehicles or you, you're naval and you want to bring in ships, then focus on that stuff. But uh, again, this, is, this tutorial is built in a lot of detail and I'm only going to cover a little bit out of that in this particular video. So engineers and operators need to quickly add realistic analytical and visual properties to objects in SDK. You may need a realistic satellite attitude, analysis of an enclosed area in a deep canyon, a mission plan for an aircraft flight route, a sensor footprint, or a briefing with the detailed visuals and analysis. In the previous lesson, you learned to create a new scenario and how to navigate windows and basic tools in SDK. In this lesson, you will learn basic understanding of SDK objects and their properties. So you're gonna learn how to update SDK databases, insert objects into your SDK scenario, and how to modify properties and understand why you're using different objects in your analysis. One of the things that a lot of people need to do is update their databases. You can go up to the Utilities menu and open up Utilities, and when you select Data Update Utility, you need an internet connection to do this. When you look at my information in here, the red data sets are data that is old and there's new data sets. And it shows you over here AGI's latest version. It'll give you the date, and the current version is when the last time it was that you updated your databases. You can also turn on and enable automatic updates. And so if you leave your computer on, SDK will automatically update these databases. Now, most of these like EOP, space weather, are for people that have more advanced capabilities in SDK. To show you how this works, make sure that you've checked all the red ones. You can leave the black ones alone because they cannot be updated. There's not a newer version yet. And once you have all those checked, you can just click update now and it's going to go out over the internet. It's also going to tell you you're going to have to restart SDK. So I'm just going to say yes, and it's going to update it. And you can see that I got a uh, progress bar in the lower right hand corner. And you're going to wait for that progress bar to go away. And you're also going to wait for all the databases to turn black. It's done. I'm going to click OK. I'm going to exit SDK. And then I'm going to bring up SDK all over again. And now SDK will be using my new databases. I'm going to restart my scenario. So I'm going to click create a scenario. I'm going to call this scenario SDK objects and properties. I'm not going to do anything else with this. I'm going to leave all the defaults. I'm just going to click OK and jump into the scenario. The scenario object, which is the main object in your scenario, it defines the context in which the properties and behavior of other objects are defined. So let me just go over this real quick. I'm going to close the Insert SDK Objects tool. I'll bring this back up in a minute. I'm going to save my scenario just to put it in a unique folder like we did in Lesson 1. And then I'm going to come over here to, to the Object Browser. I'm going to right click on SDK Object Properties and I'm going to select Properties.
You can see we're on the basic time page. When I say let's go to a specific page when you have properties open, in this case I'll say, hey, let's jump to the basic time page. You look for basic and you click on time. This is simply my analysis period that I set up and you can change it here. So let's say for instance in, in the SDK new scenario wizard, you made an incorrect analysis period. You can change it here. It's not a big deal. The epic time is the epic time of your scenario, not of satellites. Those of you that do satellites, it's different. And what I mean by think of it as a countdown. If I create an epic time, all my reports are going to be negative values till I get to that epic time and then I'm going to change the positive values. The animation that you see down here, I might have a 24 hour scenario, but maybe I'm making a movie of a five minute period. So I can come in here and set that five minute period. And so animation wise on my 2D window and my 3D window, I will only see that five minute period. The time update mode, these three equate to these three clocks that you see up here. So you can set it from here too. And then down here in the step size, this equates to the double up, double down arrows in the animation toolbar. And I can set this step time step that you see down here in the lower right hand corner. The update animation every, I haven't used it in eight years because this has to do with your graphics card or if you have hundreds of objects in your scenario and your animation seems to lock up. You can come in here and increase that update every animation every and what it does is it delays the time between your graphics card and your CPU and gives your graphics card time to send information to CPU in order to run your animation, but it will be choppy. Basic units. This is where I can set the units at the scenario level that all my objects are used. So for instance, it def the distance defaults to kilometers. I can always open up that pull down menu and say, hey, I want my scenario to run in feet. And so I could select feet. The basic database page, this allows me to change certain databases or bring in archive databases. And I'll look at this a little bit later on. The earth data, this allows you to change your EOP files. The terrain, the basic terrain, this is where you can turn streaming terrain on and off. 3D tiles, this is a really cool feature. You can add these really neat 3D tile data sets that we, we build. Um, I've looked at them for Philadelphia, I've looked at them for New York. If you have advanced capabilities in SDK, you can also use them analytically. Global attributes, these are just warnings. All I can say for people that are new, be careful about turning these warning messages off because this can tell you if something's going wrong. And finally, the description page, this is where I can add a description, a short description and a long description for notes. 2D graphic global attributes. This is scenario wide. So for instance, if I come up here to the general area and I turn off show labels, labels for all my objects in my 2D window and 3D windows will get shut down. Vehicles, if I turn off vehicle ground tracks, all my ground tracks are going to disappear. So you can turn them off at the object level or you can turn them off here, but understand that if you turn any of this stuff off here, it affects all your objects in the scenario. Anything you do in 2D graphics is applied to 3D graphics. That's important to remember. In the 3D graphic global attribute, these are 3D graphics specific. There's not a lot that most people do in here, but you can do things like switch between the WGS-84 ellipsoid, which is the surface of the uh, central body for the Earth, or mean sea level if you're doing aircraft stuff, for instance. Uh, 3D object editing, if you are a submariner and you want to go under the ocean, you can do negative altitudes. The image cache, I haven't played with it in a very long time, but if you have a very poor graphics card, you can come in here and mess with the uh, image cache and the terrain cache. All I would recommend is you go to the help pages and see the pros and cons of changing these values. And then finally, the surface lines on terrain. Terrain server defaults on, but if you turn off terrain server and you have your own terrain or, or you're just using WGS84 ellipsoid, you might want to consider coming in here and turning on so that you'll see your lines for things like area targets. 
You can also go to the 2D graphic fonts and change the size of the fonts in the 2D window, and you can change the fonts in the 3D window. Maybe you're doing a presentation and you need larger fonts in your windows. Now, a minute ago, I turned off the Insert SDK Objects tool. If I go back up here to the toolbar, this icon right here called Insert Object will allow me to open that back up. I can also go up to the um, insert menu and select new and it will also open it up. So whatever way you like doing it, you just have to find what works for you and use it. Let's say for instance, you're just a satellite operator and you don't need all these other objects in the scenario objects list, or you want to turn attach objects on and off. You can simply go down and click this button right here that says edit preferences. And this is where you can turn objects on and off inside the Insert SDK Objects tool. We got Scenario Objects. These objects get attached to the Scenario Object up here, Scenario Level Objects. The only way you can use Attach Objects, and the SDK Free only gives you the sensor, you can select the sensor, but you need a Scenario Level Object to attach it to. And then finally, over on the right, they give you methods. So like if I click the place object, you can see my different methods. I can do a search by address from city database, shape files, so on and so forth. They're all different. But you can pick the method of how you want to enter that object into your scenario. So we're going to look at a couple of our objects, some of the more important ones. I know a lot of people use satellites, so I'll show you the satellite object. So I'm going to go into the Insert SDK Objects tool. I'm going to select Satellite as my object. And we'll start with From Standard Object Database. I'll select that and click Insert. Everybody likes the International Space Station, so that's what I'll use. Now, I could type in ISS and go down and click Search, and you're going to get a lot of hits. You're going to get things that have decayed. You're going to get some of them that are operational, not operational. This is a lot of stuff to go through. Debris, that's what the DEB means in here. So what I think I'll do is I'm going to put in the NORAD catalog number. We call it the SSC number, and for the ISS it's 25544. Uh, when I go down to the bottom and click search, now I just narrowed it down to these three selections. If you're wondering why three, if they're all the same, if you look in here, you can see that I have different data sources. The first one, ISS Zarya, is using the AGI Standard Object Data Service. That means if I select that, it's going to download it from the AGI server, and it's going to propagate it into your scenario using TLEs and using the SGP4 propagator. The other two, ISS and then Zarya, are from your local database. You need to be careful about using these if you haven't updated your databases to match your scenario times. So I'm going to go ahead and select the ISS Zarya, the one that's going to come in from the AGI Standard Object Data Service. And if you're wondering what Zarya is, if you're not a Russian speaker, it's just, it just means sunrise in Russian. I'm going to go down and click Insert. And it's going to download that satellite from the AGI server. It's going to load it into your scenario and propagate it using the SGP4 propagator. Once it's in there, I'm going to close my search standard object data window. I'm going to look at my 2D window and my 3D window. So I'll just go up here to the window menu, select tile vertically, and I can see the orbital track for both the 2D window and the 3D window. They're different. In the 3D window, I can see the actual orbit and I can see the ground track. In the 2D window, I can only see the ground track. If I go up to the animation toolbar and I click start and animate my scenario, I can see the satellite as it orbits the Earth in both windows. I'm going to go back up to the animation toolbar, click the red reset button and move on. Real-time animation mode will allow me to view the ISS where it is at this moment in time. But your animation time that you set has to cover the real time that you're sitting at your computer at. So right now I'm good because it's very late in the afternoon where I'm at. So I can go up here and turn on real-time animation mode 
And now when I reset my scenario and click start, it's going to show me where the ISS is at this very moment in time. And if I zoom to the ISS in the 3D window, and to do that, you go over to the object browser, right click on ISS, select zoom to, and I can see the beautiful model that we give you guys. And if I look down, I can see where it's located over North America right now. At, in my scenario, yours might be different. I'm over Canada actually. So this is operational way of using this. Again, you have to understand that you need to set your analysis time period to cover the actual time that you're in right now so that you can use real-time animation mode. I'm gonna reset that. I can also pick the third clock, X real-time. That's not real-time, now I'm back to my analysis time. It's gonna go at real-time speed, but it's showing me the satellite based on my analysis time, not based on the actual real time. I'm gonna reset. I'm gonna open up the properties for the ISS. I'm gonna right click on ISS, select properties. And in here, I can see the TLE source. If I click preview, I can see how old the TLE is for this satellite. And this will work for all satellites that you bring in using TLEs, two line element sets. And I can see some orbital parameters. I'm gonna close that, I'm gonna cancel my properties, and I'm gonna show you how to bring a satellite in manually. Something that you wanna build, something that you might be testing for future use. So I'm gonna go back into the Insert SDK Objects tool. I'm gonna select Satellite as my object, and this time I'm gonna select Orbit Wizard as my method and click Insert. You can pick the orbit type that you want to use. So in this case, I'll go ahead and simply click repeating ground trace. I'll just call it repeat sat so I can give it a name. I can set the approximate altitude. I'll just go ahead and jump this up to 750 kilometers. Understand that this is the distance, the, the altitude of the satellite based off the surface of the earth. That's not semi-major axis altitude. And there's some other settings in here that you can play with if you come back and look at this. Now again, when you're in a GUI and you wonder what all these different settings do, you can always click the help button and it'll open up a help file for this specific GUI. The time interval, the analysis time period interval, it defaults to your scenario time. That means that if you don't change this, whenever you bring a satellite in, and this, this also applies to using a standard optic database, it's going to propagate your satellite based on your analysis period. When I click OK, I now have another satellite in my scenario. I'm going to open up Repeat Sats Properties. J2 Perturbation, I can manipulate the properties right here if I want. Instead of using the Orbit Wizard, I can turn on vectors and body axes so I can go down to the 3D Graphics Vector page. I can turn things on like the sun vector. I can go to the axes tab and I can turn on the body axes. If I want to change the color, I just double click on this color palette right here to give me a pull down menu and I can change that if I'd like. When I click apply, I'll be able to view these in the 3D graphic window because it's 3D. So if I go back over here to repeat sat, right click and select zoom to, there's my satellite. I got my body X along the velocity vector, my body Z is pointing down to the center of the Earth, my body Y is off to the right, and I have my sun vector that stays locked onto the sun. And when I click start, I'm going to go ahead and change it to normal animation mode so it goes faster. You can see it following the sun. I'm going to reset that. Other things that you might need to do when you're inside here is setting up attitude profiles. We give you a couple attitude profiles for free. So if I go back in here to the basic attitude page, I can come up here to the basic type. It defaults a nadir alignment with ECI velocity constraint. That's why I have the X body along the velocity vector, the Z body pointing down. 
if I go ahead and change this, now I'll do ECF velocity alignment with radial constraints. So if I open up this pull down menu and select that, so ECI velocity alignment with radial constraint. When I apply this, if you watch my satellite in the 3D graphics window, now my X body is still along the direction of travel, but now my Z body is pointing in the opposite direction. There might be reasons why you need to use different attitudes. I'm going to go ahead and put it back to Renator alignment with ECI velocity constraint and click OK. Like I said, we're not going to cover everything. You can go in to the scenario properties and this is what I was talking about earlier. You can go to the database page and you can click update database files. This is where you can update your satellite databases or you can bring in an archive database for an older time period if you want. I'm going to close that. I'm going to cancel that. Again, you can get more detailed information in the tutorial if that's something you need to look at. I want to show you the aircraft object. I'm going to go into the Insert SDK Objects tool. I'll select Aircraft and Insert Default. To rename an object, if you come over here to the object browser, I can just right click on the aircraft and I can select rename. And it puts me in rename mode. There's other ways you can do it too. I can click on it. If you need to do a little meditation and Zen breathing, you can click on the aircraft once, take a deep breath, click on it a second time and it'll go into rename mode. F2 will also put you in the rename mode. I'm going to call this aircraft my plane, my plane. Hit my enter key and it sticks. I don't see the plane on the map because I haven't entered anything. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom into North America to show you how this works. Again, if you want more detail, go to the tutorial and check it out. I'm going to open up the properties for my plane. So I'll right click on my plane and select properties. And now if I go back to the 2D window and I'm going to click on the tab, wherever I click on the map, and you can see I got a little aircraft symbol here, it's going to create waypoints. I'm going to open up the properties for the plane again. I'm going to go back to the properties by clicking on the tab and there's my waypoints. The altitude reference defaults to WGS 84. Being an X flyer, I like to use mean sea level. Smooth rate calculation, which is what we're on, allows me to move based on altitude, speed, and turn radius. And there's my, my waypoints. Now understand, you can come in here and insert points and type in the latitude and longitude. You can also go into these cells, like for altitude and speed, and you can change them individually for each one of your waypoints. The set all button that you see over here allows me to set all of them. So you can see my altitude is at 10.668 kilometers. If I want to move it to feet and I don't know what the unit is for feet, that KM for kilometers is the unit. I can open up this little pull down menu and select FT for feet if you didn't know what that was. And then I can just change the value. But understand this that throughout SDK, you're going to see these little pull down menus that allow you to change units. Being an X flyer, I never mission planned an aircraft mission in kilometers per second. We did mock really simple things like that, but SDK is kilometers per second, nautical miles per hour, that kind of thing. So let's say for instance, I want to change this to nautical miles per hour. So I can just go ahead and open up that pull down, I can go down to NM for nautical miles, and then the next one that comes up, I can select our HR. 350 nautical miles per hour. I'll go ahead and change that to 400, just to change it. Then the turn radius. This is a huge turn radius. That's, that's saying to me that when the plane gets to one waypoint and turns to another waypoint, it's gonna take a, almost 12 kilometers of radius. I'm gonna knock that down to two. I don't need to change the unit because I'm keeping the same unit. So by highlighting everything, putting the value and hitting tab, STK will fill that in for you. The nice thing about this now, when I click OK, it changes all of them. 
Again, you can insert points manually, enter the latitudes and longitudes manually, the altitudes manually, the speeds manually, the turn radius manually, or you can click on the map like I did, come back, click set all, and change everything using the set all button. I'm gonna click OK, and when I get back out here, I now have my aircraft. And if I zoom to the aircraft over here in the object browser, right click, select zoom to, I can see this really cool plane. Now I do want to show you something real quick. The great arc propagator is what we use, it's up here at the top. The great arc propagator is also used for a ground vehicle, which I'm not going to cover in this particular video. And it also is used for the ship object. So if you know how to use the great arc propagator for an aircraft, you'll be able to use it for a ground vehicle or for the ship. One thing that's important for this, if I come up here to the second waypoint where I make my turn, and I'm gonna go into that cell for time, and I'm gonna do a control C and copy it. I'm gonna come up here to the animation toolbar where we see current scenario time. I'm gonna click in there and do a control V and paste it. When I hit my enter key, it's gonna jump my scenario to that time. Notice that the aircraft's in a turn, but it's flat. Maybe I want the aircraft to bank. So what I'm gonna do is go up, come up here and go to the basic attitude page. And I'm gonna to go to the basic type, open up the pull down menu, change it to, to coordinate a turn. And watch what happens when I click apply. The plane banks. And the nice thing about this is it's based on the radius of the turn and how fast your plane is flying. There's no slip. Okay, it's, it's just assuming that your aircraft is flying in a perfect world with no wind and no forces against the aircraft. But in the real world, if you were sitting on this plane doing 400 nautical miles per hour, everybody would be screaming. So that's the aircraft object and the great arc propagator. Let's look at a couple ground objects. So I'm gonna go ahead and click OK, close my properties. The next thing I'm gonna look at here real quick is the facility object. So I'm gonna go back into the Insert SDK Objects tool. I'm gonna select Facility as my object. And I'm gonna do from Standard Object Database. Now we have three objects in SDK that are ground objects. that use latitude and longitude, and you wouldn't know the difference if you open up their properties which one it is. It's the object type itself that SDK sees as a different object type, and you'll see they look different on your map, and some of them come in with different databases. So if I select facility and I go to from standard object database and click insert, I'm gonna go ahead up here to the name and I'm gonna type in white sands. When I do a search, it's going to show me all the different places on white sands like ground sites, launch pads, ground stations, sometimes radar sites. It depends on which facility you're using. I can see all that here. Maybe I just want launch pads. So I go up here to roll. I select launch pad. And maybe I only want to see the active launch pad. So I go down here to status and select active. When I do a search, now I only see the active launch pads at White Sands. I can also go down to the network. I'm not gonna do this, but down here in network, maybe you work with a specific network of facilities. You can just pick that network and it'll load all the facilities for that specific network. So I'm gonna go back to this. I'm gonna select White Sands SULF and I'm gonna click insert. It's gonna download it and load that launch pad. I'm gonna close the search standard object data window. And I'm gonna to zoom to White Sands. There's my facility object out there in White Sands, beautiful New Mexico. Another thing I can do is insert an area target, both manually or from a database. So I'll do it from a database first. I'm gonna go up here to the Insert SDK Objects tool. I'm gonna to select area target as my object, select countries and US states as my method, and click insert. I'm just gonna bring in the continental US. So I'm gonna scroll down till I find United States. 
United States of America. I do want you to notice that when I selected that, insert turned on and I get a selection for primary area only in all areas. There's a huge difference here between the two. Primary area only is going to be the main part of that country. In this case, it's going to be pretty much the continental U.S. All areas would bring in Alaska, all the Aleutian Islands, all the Hawaiian Islands, Guam, different things like that. It all comes down to what you need. I'm just going to use primary area only so you can see what it looks like. So I'm going to click insert. And you can see, I'll close this, you can see in my 2D graphic window, it loaded the primary area only, the United States. There's a couple ways to bring in an area target that you want to build. So I'll just quickly show you how this works. If I go back into the Insert SDK Objects tool and select Area Target and Area Target Wizard and click Insert, Understand that you can bring in a default area target and open up the properties and do the same thing I'm doing with the wizard, but I think the wizard's a little bit easier. So I'll just call this uh, ops area just to give it a name. You get two choices, area type. It can either be a pattern, which is a polygon, or an ellipse, which is an ellipse. I'll click insert point and I'll just do an area target. I'll do one degree latitude I'll do minus two degrees longitude insert point I'll do minus one degree just I'll just change the longitude here I'm just trying to show you how this works insert point now I'll change the latitude make it two degrees Insert point one more time and change my longitude back to the original longitude because I need to close it off. Let me give it a lighter color so you can see it. And now when I click OK, if I zoom out in my 2D window, there's my area target. And this can come in handy if you need to enclose a certain area and do analysis in a specific area. But that's how it works. It's real simple. I can also see this in my 3D graphic window if I do a home view and turn this around and there's my area target. Again, if you go into the tutorial, there's a very detailed section in here how to do both a pattern and an ellipse. I highly recommend looking at that. So we looked at a facility object, we looked at an area target. Let's uh, go ahead and real quick, let's look at a target object. So I'm gonna go in to Insert SDK Objects tool again. I'm gonna select target as my object. We'll do an insert default as the method and click insert. And you can see it actually popped up near my ops area. Because it defaults to zero degrees latitude, zero degrees longitude. If I go ahead and do a home view, you can see that over here. Let's look at the place object real quick. I use the place object pretty much for everything. I use targets if I have a satellite taking pictures of places on the ground, I make the places on the ground a target. I also might make my facilities, I only use the facility object when I'm actually using facilities. But a place object, I'll use anything for an address. I might use the place object for the corner of a roof where I'm going to place an antenna, for instance, or a sensor. So that's when I use the place object. I use it for just about everything else to anchor somewhere on the surface of the earth. In this instance, I'm just going to use from city database, but if you use search by address, you can go to your house. So you can open that up on your own, um, type in your address and do a search. From City Database will bring in the centroid of a city area. So if I click insert and I go up to name here and maybe I'll type in Denver. And when I go down and click search, I'll pick Denver, Colorado. And when I do an insert, I'll show you what it goes to here. I'll do that in the 3D window. So I'll bring the 3D window to the front and I'll do a zoom two to Denver. And again, like I said, it takes you to this, a centroid, whoever built this. And in this case, it just happens to be the state capital. 
let's bring in a missile object. A lot of people use it. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom back to White Sands. And I'm going to launch the missile from this spot. So I'm going to go ahead and uncheck White Sands here. So and that all that does in the object browser is it turns it off visually, but it's still there analytically. So what I'll do here is I'll bring in a missile object using the insert SDK objects tool. I'll do an insert default, click insert. I'm not going to rename it. I'll just go ahead and open up the properties for my missile. So I'll right click, select properties. The smart way to do this is to type in the launch latitude and longitude and to type in the impact latitude and longitude. But in this instance, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cheat a little bit and click on the 2D window because there's another way to do it too. So I'm going to go to the 2D graphic window. And I'm going to go over here to white sands and I well, guess I got to turn it back on for a second here so I can see it. I'm going to go ahead and click in White Sands as my launch point. I'm going to get this insufficient Delta V specified. You can just click OK and close that. And then I'll go over and I'll click on my ops area where I'm going to impact my missile. And you can see that it created that route. If I go back to the properties for my missile, it filled in my launch la latitude longitude and my impact latitude and longitude. I can change the speed. I can increase it, decrease it. I can set fixed apogee altitude, which you'll do in the tutorial. So this is something you might want to come back and play with, but this is how it works. I'll click OK. If I look at my 3D graphic window, I can actually see if I do a, a um, home view, I can actually see the missiles flight. Let me go ahead. I can go over here in the object browser, double click on this little color window here and change the color right from the object browser. And you can see the missiles flight route. And it uses the ballistic missile propagator. So what goes up must come down when you use the ballistic propagator. So there's a lot of other things inside the tutorial on how to use the 3D object editor. Um, I'll show that to you real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in another place object. So I'll go in and to the insert SDK objects tool. This will be the last thing I show you. So I'll select place. I'll do an insert default, click insert, and you'll see that it brings it in as place one. If I bring another place, it'll call it place two, so on and so forth. STK automatically gives it a one-up number because all your objects, they have to have their own unique name. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, zoom to that place. And just like the, the uh, missile object, I can go open up the properties of the place object and I can click somewhere in the 2D graphic window and it'll move the place to that. But I just want to show you the 3D object editor real fast. And that's this tool right here. The key to using this tool is opening up the pull down menu, selecting the object you want to edit. So I'm going to select the place. Then I have two icons here. I have an object edit start except that allows me to start the editing process. Then I have the object edit cancel. If I totally mess it up, I can cancel it and start all over again. So the way this works is if I click object edit start except, it's going to show you where it's located. Let's say, for instance, I want to move it over here because I want it to be an attachment place for a sensor object. So I can go ahead and click my shift key on my keyboard, hold it down, left click my mouse, and it'll move that place to that spot. When I go back up here to the 3D object editor and click object edit start except, my place has now moved to that spot. And I'll go ahead and change the color so you can see it better. The last thing is I'm going to attach a sensor object to that place object. So I'm going to go back into the Insert SDK Objects tool, select Sensor as an attached object, Insert Default as the method, and click Insert. When the select object window appears, I'm going to select my place object, place one. That's the object I'm going to attach it to and then click OK. If I lay this over now and look at it, I can see that sensor pointing up. When you put a sensor on a ground object, it points up. When you put a sensor on an airborne object, it points down.
I'll go in here and right click on the sensor, select properties. And the sensor type defaults to a simple conic, 45 degrees cone half angle. And what that really means is that you have a full 90 degree field of view. If I change this cone half angle to 90 degrees, now I got a full 180 degree field of view. I click apply, then I'm gonna go down to constraints. Constraints are very important. Line of sight means I'm doing horizon to horizon based on the WGS84. Field of view, if I have that on, which it defaults on, it's making that sensor only see objects that fly through it. If I go up here to range, I'm gonna turn on max for the range and I'll change the range, let's say to 1000 kilometers. I'll click OK, and if I come back out here to my 3D graphic window and I zoom out, you can see that set field of view for that sensor. And if I run any analyses against any of my objects in my scenario, that sensor will only see them when they fly through that field of view. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop. I highly recommend you go back to the tutorial, find the objects you're interested in, and go through this in detail because it's very important that you understand how these objects work. And I have a feeling like most people, you really wanna look at the uh, satellite objects again, you're gonna to wanna to look at sensor objects again and see how all this stuff works. So in our second scenario, we begin with an understanding of the purpose of the Insert SDK Objects tool. And we also looked at bringing objects in SDK and how to change their properties. We followed this with an in-depth discussion on all the default scenario and attached objects found in the Insert SDK Objects tool. And we also looked at how to insert objects into the scenario and which method to use during that insertion. So have a great day, and I'll see you in tutorial number three.